Hello, everyone, and welcome to Professional Previews. My name is Michael Lewis, and today I am joined by Murray Burgess and virtually by Lauren Farr. Um, so they'll take a second to introduce themselves in just a little bit, but first I want to go over a couple of ground rules. Um, feel free to drop any questions or comments in the chat as we're going. Um, we'll try to get to those uh, at the end of our presentations. Um, and at the very end, we'll stop the recording and then you all will have a chance to unmute yourselves and talk directly to our presenters today. Um, uh, due to some technical difficulties, we won't be able to have captions on the Zoom. But if you're watching the recording on YouTube, you can watch it uh, with captions there. And so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with um, Murray's presentation. Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. This is great. Uh, my name is Murray Burgess, and I am a current PhD candidate at North Carolina State University. Um, I am also a public scientist, and I am a children's author, and I am the founder, co-founder and CEO of Field Inclusive, which is a new nonprofit dedicated towards helping people in the natural sciences feel more safe out in the field. And so today I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of my research and why field safety is an important thing for DEI efforts. So first of all, a little bit about me. I was always interested in wildlife and animals, and so I immediately jumped into a wildlife program at Mississippi State. Um, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to research to get. I loved snakes a lot, and I liked doing um, camera trap research. <laughs> and so I dabbled a little bit, but it wasn't until I took an ornithology class that I fell absolutely in love with birds and knew that was exactly what I wanted to go into for grad school. And so that's how I ended up at North Carolina State. And my current research is looking at how does artificial light at night affect the metabolic health and physical development of songbirds, with my um, focal species being barn swallow chicks. So I am out in the field every March to July field season, um, setting up lights and like testing barn swallow chicks, like how they're growing up in the light versus natural conditions. I always say I run like a little doctor's office for the birds yeah. as I like draw their blood and like measure them and everything. And it's really, really fun. I love doing this. And one of the things that I have to keep in mind though is the whole safety aspect. Um, I started my research in 2020 during the pandemic, which meant that I couldn't have any assistance out there with me due to like pandemic protocols. So I was out there by myself in rural North Carolina um, and it, the environment on my way to the study site did not feel very welcoming. There were like Confederate flags everywhere and just like a little, a little anxious for someone who is a black woman doing field work by themselves. Sometimes at night, um, as I have to go and like check the lights and everything. And so I always try to make sure when I was out at night to bring a friend or always have my dog with me and just like be extra alert. But those kinds of things make me realize that there aren't really a whole lot of protections out there for field workers. Um, you're just like expected to kind of go and like do your work and the field safety is more focused on the wildlife like you know coyotes poisonous snakes how right. to remove ticks and stuff from your body but there's no um, field safety related to like interpersonal conflicts with other humans and so before I like dive into like what those conflicts are I just wanted everyone to kind of consider the question what does a field biologist look like and of course, you know, these are three icons that I grew up with and love very much. And it's usually what comes to people's minds when you talk about a wildlife biologist. Um, so, but think about like what struggles like these people might face versus a struggle that like someone who looks like me might face. Because there are many unique concerns for like marginalized field biologists. You could face like discrimination from like property owners or like just curious members of the public who don't think you're supposed to be out there or don't see you as like working in an official capacity. Um, there's risk for unnecessary attention from police 
or you just have to like try to like hide or mask your identities or like try to blend in as much as possible. Um, also, there might be like isolation or neglect from your department or university or organization because people just aren't aware of these kind of risks that might happen to non-white researchers. And I highlighted some common scenarios that to emphasize that it's not just about race, it can also be about sexuality or gender expression, it could be about religion, it could be about disability. So there are many, many considerations um, when it comes to stuff like this. So we don't wanna leave people with like this feeling of like, oh, there's nothing we can do and it's like scary out there because there are some solutions to put in place. Um, and one thing that Field Inclusive really wants to highlight is like this safety training for like all staff for all people who are going out into the field. Um, the safety training that addresses the interpersonal human to human interactions rather than just the you know, wildlife safety. Mm -hmm. um, also something that's really helped, especially me, is um, having access to identifying equipment um, I was able to talk to my department and get some car magnets to put on my car and that like kind of identified me as like, oh, I'm out here doing official work and it's like I'm a researcher and that kind of like deters people coming up to me um, off the bat because I was like, oh, well, there's a label there, so right. she must be doing something. And of course, just everybody continue like emotional and financial support, like check on your field biologist friends all the time. <laughs> <laughs> We're usually out there in the heat and like by ourselves, like struggling. So just, just ask them what they need. <laughs> and that is kind of the idea behind why Lauren and I started Field Inclusive because of there not being any of those policies already in place in many places, not just NC State. And so we are seeking to um, support marginalized and historically excluded field researchers and make sure and provide those resources like uh, financial aid, field safety resources, um, templates for making all the field safety gear or templates for like how to attract a diverse applicant pool into your like field biology positions. And um, Lauren will definitely talk more about this in her presentation, but that is one of the things that we are super passionate about. And um, so to conclude, what does a field biologist actually look like? It can look like anybody, any race, any age, any expression, any ability level, just let's broaden that idea of what a field biologist looks like and not discriminate against anybody. We're all great. Um, and I'll go ahead and throw my contact information up there. I don't know if like we're pausing for questions or anything or just jump into Lauren's presentation, but. We'll go ahead and jump to Lauren's okay. um, and then we can come back and that way people can ask questions for both awesome. of you all at one time. Yep. All right, and so Lauren, we'll toss it over to you. Sounds great. All right, go ahead and share my screen. All right, are you seeing all that okay? Yes. Okay. Good. Wonderful. Great, great, great. So technology is working with us today. That's that's awesome. Um, so uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Happy New Year to you all. For um, those of you online who are joining us, I hope the New Year's treating you well. Uh, so Murray gave a wonderful presentation and overview about, um, you know, the inspiration behind Field Inclusive and what we uh, you know, hope to stand for and what we want to see with our organization going and moving forward. So with that, I'm going to follow up that presentation with sort of just diving into, again, what we hope to see with our organization in the future, what opportunities we have available um, for marginalized and historically excluded individuals and what we hope to have available in the future, as well as jumping into how you as a individual institution or, or organization can help us out along the way. So uh, again, my name is um, Lauren D. Farr. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the other CEO and co-founder of Field Inclusive. So I will dive in to my presentation uh, titled The Future of Field Safety. 
So before I get started, though, I want to give a shout out and special thank you to our sponsors and partners. So the Nature Conservancy was the first um, ever sponsor to jump on board with us. Uh, we are super grateful because with their sponsorship, we were able to put on our inaugural Field Inclusive Week, which I will talk about more later in my presentation. But with that, we were able to um, have this lineup of amazing speakers and panelists and presenters, and we're able to um, compensate them for their time. And that is one thing that Field Inclusive stands for, and one thing that um, all organizations uh, should stand for when they have speakers who are asking people to come out and put some time and effort into giving you know, a presentation. Um, so with that, uh, we want to say thank you very much to the Nature Conservancy, um, as well as thank you to our College of Natural Resources um, at North Carolina State University. So uh, along with them uh, reminding us that Murray and I are both PhD students and we are here to finish our PhDs, uh, they have been super, super helpful along the way of wanting to really jump into our initiative and letting us know that this is very important. It's very um, timely. It's great that, you know, we thought about this and they want to help us in any way, shape or form that they can. So we want to give a special shout out and thanks to the um, faculty and staff who have taken the time uh, so far to sit down with us and advise us, um, work on us on some um, current and future ideas. Uh, so just wanted to give a shout out there before I jump into my presentation. All right, so a little bit about myself here. So um, I am currently a second year PhD student at NC State University in the College of Natural Resources, pursuing my degree in fisheries, wildlife and conservation biology. Uh, I am a avian ecologist and specifically I work with and study the federally endangered red cockaded woodpecker. So uh, my field site is out in the North Carolina Sandhills, uh, the Sandhills game land specifically in Richmond County, North Carolina. And it is a public area so anybody can come out there and you know hunt, fish, bike, horseback ride, what have you. It's a very recreational area, but it is also home to the longleaf pine ecosystem, as well as to this federally endangered species, the red cockaded woodpecker. So I've been doing this research for two years now. I stumbled upon it uh, for my dissertation work. I was introduced to the um, people who have been working on this species for years. And so with that, not only do I get to uh, carry out my research looking at climate change impacts on the RCW's uh, nestling success, but I also get to actually help manage a um, RCW or RCW populations out there. So I get a fun and exciting two for one and I wouldn't have it any other way because it really allows you to um, really see the work and time and effort that's getting put into managing a federally endangered species. So in my perfect, perfect world, uh, I would, um, I've fallen in love with this project so much that I would um, love to see myself continue on with this research, bringing on my own students, exposing them to, you know, this, this work that's very, very, um, very, very important when we're talking about conservation. Um, so that's a little bit about what I do. So aside from that, again, I am the um, other CEO and co-founder of Field Inclusive. And here at in CSU, I do a lot of DEI focused work within um, our university, our department, college, and our program, the Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology Program, on working to increase that diversity, but centering around the idea of inclusivity, which again, it's not going to happen overnight, but um, we're not going to be able to fix it overnight, but we're just continuing to work and make these little changes that hopefully will make a bigger impact in the future. So um, I'm hoping that sharing with you my background, you see how I sort of fit into, um, or how I fit into field inclusive in our initiative here of um, amplifying and supporting marginalized and historically excluded individuals who professionally work outdoors. Dance. Here we go. All right. So for our discussion today, I just have this little outline of what I will go over here in my presentation. So again, following up with Murray's presentation, she gave a great overview of the inspiration behind Field Inclusive um, and what we're hoping to uh, accomplish as a as an organization. So I will go a little bit more into uh, things such as resources and grants as well as collaborations and partnerships. Because again, we here at Field Inclusive are always looking for collaborations and partnerships with organizations or institutions, especially to get um, minorities into the field, get them field experience, and hopefully really working to diversify uh, the natural sciences 
as a whole. Um, and then I will also go into ways that you can support us again as an individual institution or organization, as well as talking about upcoming events. So that's where I will hone in on that field inclusive week that I mentioned previously. So before I get started, I want to throw out a definition for you all. So the definition of safety, I pulled it right from Webster's Dictionary online, but um, safety is defined as the condition of being protected from or unlikely to cause danger, risk, or injury. So one thing that Murray and I have realized while starting this organization and talking with different individuals is that we really have to take a step back when it comes to certain things, particularly when it comes to individuals who have not um, had to experience what minorities have had to experience when it comes to professionally working in the outdoors. So when we talk about safety, as Murray mentioned earlier, um, usually what organizations and institutions will hone on is what we call physical field safety. So that includes identifying poisonous plants, uh, identifying dangerous animals, poisonous snakes, spiders, uh, ticks, um, as well as stump holes, looking out for stump holes. And you'll see why I put stump holes here as a um, example, because this comes from a conversation that I had with an individual at an institution. So this is what we're meeting when we're talking about physical field safety. And while that is important, it is extremely important to know, you know, how to identify um, poison ivy or how to know if a snake is dangerous or not. But this is not what we here at Field Inclusive are focusing on. Instead, we are focusing on social field safety. So um, this illustration comes from a uh, publication, a journal publication from Demary et al. 2020. And um, in this, again, and Murray put it in her presentation too, and she made a good point here that I wrote down that it's not just about race. So um, here, this is what we're meaning when we're talking about uh, social field safety, social field safety, interacting with the public. So again, not just being about race, but other things, um, being from a different country, being from the LGBTQ plus community, uh, having disabilities, all of these things fall under uh, what we're meaning when we're describing social field safety and the interactions that these individuals, um, at-risk individuals that we're defining them, these at-risk individuals can have with the general public. So again, although physical field safety is very, very important, we here at Field Inclusive are focusing on the social aspect of field safety, which we feel like needs to be raised to the same bar when we're discussing um, physical field safety. So I go back to the example of the stump holes and I go back to me talking about us realizing that we need to really take a step back and take baby steps and take the time to define what field inclusive is really, really uh, representing here when it comes to social field safety. Um, and I use this as an example. Again, this is not to pick fun of this individual, but instead it's I'm using it as an educational uh, example. So um, I was talking with this individual from an institution and they automatically just assumed that our um, organization was focusing on physical field safety. Uh, this individual was a middle-aged white male. So obviously right off the bat, he had no idea that social field safety was a thing. Um, until I started to explain to him that, well, this is what we're meaning by social field safety. This is what field inclusive is about, et cetera, et cetera. And then he goes on to say, you know, oh, well, I, I never really, you know, thought about that. But, you know, if it was me, I would just carry a gun. Or if it was me, I would just, you know, if I felt unsafe, I would just call the police. Well, you have to take a step back and realize that when you put minorities in, you know, in this, in these two examples here, um, there's different outcomes that, you know, can possibly happen. First and foremost, uh, using race as an example. So for those of you who may cannot see me, I'm an average sized black woman with brown hair and brown eyes. My skin already makes me a target. Uh, and again, not just being about race, but having a disability makes you a target coming from a different country makes you a target. All of these things makes you a target. So when we're talking about carrying a gun, okay, let's be real here. Um, a black person with a gun, we're already gonna be you know, assumed a threat. Uh, when we are talking about calling the police, 
do not get me wrong. Law enforcement does, law enforcement is important. They do many, many great things for us. However, looking at, you know, looking in the past when we're looking at things that have, um, you know, come about when it comes to minorities, black individuals, police, police brutality, the last thing that we're gonna think about is calling the police because we just don't want to have a negative interaction. So really, 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 again, taking that step back and really defining what we mean by social field safety and how it can be um, different when you are from a minority community. So again, this individual, then he realized that he, he talked about his flaws. That's what we want. And so that's why I'm saying that I'm not trying to poke fun of him or, you know, say that, oh, wow, I can't believe that he didn't know this. But it just made us realize that we really need to take a step back when it comes to talking about social field safety and how it can be important for minorities. So with that being said, I will now go into um, field inclusive, what we're hoping to do as a new organization and the different things that we have um, available and want to have available in the future. So we have some resources here. We, we don't want to just be a social media movement, but we want to also offer tangible and actionable improvements in field research issues when it comes to diversity, um, when it comes to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So what we have, so what Murray mentioned here was talking about um, this identifying gear when it comes to field safety. So she worked with our college to get these, um, these car magnets that we can use to put on our cars when we're in the outdoors because it limits that interaction with people who may be curious um, and who may be wanting to know like, what is this person doing out here? Because, you know, we can't exist in the outdoors like our white counterparts. We can't just be out enjoying nature. We can't be, you know, out doing our research, just being everyday individual. There always has to be some question that comes about when you see a minority individual in the outdoors. That's just reality right now. And we would want, we want to work to change that. So these magnets offer a barrier for that. Uh, just another, another thing, you know, to make us feel safe. So we want to create this field safety gear, which is how um, our college comes into play with uh, our with the 2023 crowdfunding projects that they're calling them. So we put in a project that we wanted to fundraise and raise money to make gear like this, car magnets, um, uh, personalized ID badges, uh, vests, visors and hats, everything that houses our College of Natural Resources logo when we're out in the field to make us feel safe, to make people aware that, oh, they're from the College of Natural Resources you know, and again, limit that interaction instead of just being out there in the outdoors with nothing on. Because again, we can't exist in the outdoors like our white counterparts. Um, so along with that, Field Inclusive also strives to make um, safety learning modules that we would want, you know, um, institutions to use uh, and require their faculty, staff, and students to take so that they're aware of these, um, so that they are aware of these issues when it comes to social field safety. Uh, we want to also offer field safety workshops, uh, codes of conduct for staff and uh, visitors, templates for advertisements to target marginalized and historically excluded individuals. So one of our um, potential partners that we hope to work with in the future, they were, they were telling Murray, Murray had a meeting with them, and they were telling her that, you know, well, we want to cater to a diverse, you know, pool of applicants, but we never get diverse applicants. What is wrong with our application? What are we doing wrong? So we're hoping that we can, um, we can, you know, make and produce these templates that, you know, organizations can use when they go out there and they put out a call, you know, for an internship or a fellowship, what have you, um, even a position in their, in their workplace. We also uh, want to offer grants. So we don't, our organization doesn't want to be all about money. However, we know that researchers need money to do research. Trust me, we know. Murray and I have applied to multiple, multiple grants to do our research. And so we know the struggle. So um, with these grants, we offer a few things. So we have some scholarships, uh, travel awards and fellowships. So right now we have an ongoing scholarship for $500 that's live right now. Uh, deadline is February 1st. Um, but then we also would like to offer some travel awards and some fellowships. All of these are helping to, you know, break down those financial barriers. 
Um, the scholarships, we want them to be used, you know, for a marginalized and historically excluded individual who's doing a research project that involves data collection that can help them with housing and transportation, et cetera. Travel awards. Attending conferences is expensive. When you, when you put in the registration fees, the travel, the lodging fees, it's very, very expensive. So we want to offer a travel, travel awards for marginalized and historically excluded individuals, as well as we wanna offer fellowships. So the fellowships come into play when we're talking about getting those, uh, when we're talking about getting those outdoor and research experiences. And we want to be able to put individuals from marginalized and historically excluded communities in those spaces. And with that, we would like to offer those fellowships, which will be used for things such as relocation fees, rent, groceries, et cetera, et cetera. So in order to be able to offer those grants, develop these resources that we want to do, again, talking about the identifying gear, we're partnering with our college in order to fundraise money for that. But field inclusive in general, we, you know, we need your help. We need your help as an individual. We need your help as an institution. We need your help as an organization. So sponsorships, collaborations, and donations. We're looking for that all the time. So our current sponsorships right now, again, we have the Nature Conservancy. We have um, North Carolina Sea Grant, which uh, is coming on in uh, this year, in the next few weeks. Um, and then we also have Wilson Ornithological Society, who is coming on board as well. Collaboration-wise, again, I talked about um, our College of Natural Resources. Um, and also we have Wigget University and Winthrop University coming on here in the next few months to get some fellowships started up and to get some minorities out in the field to get them some field experience. Uh, donations. We have had more than 20 donations so far. Uh, we started this organization back in August of 2022. Uh, we've had more than 20 donations from individuals ranging, ranging from anywhere from 20 to $500. Um, I mean, you know, so I'm going to actually, while I have it on my mind here, um, I would, or maybe the museum will share it with you later. We'll share our contact information and our website and everything like that. But there is a uh, page on there where you can go on there and make some donations. Donations in any amount help us. I mean, any amount. It can be as little as a dollar. It can be $5. I mean, anything helps us, you know, when we're wanting here, you know, to continue to support our um, our initiative. So with your donation, with your sponsorship, with these collaborations, uh, you are saying that you are willing to help knock down these financial barriers and that you're committed to furthering the development and advancement of historical historically excluded minorities um, in the natural sciences. So consider donating um, or consider a collaboration or consider a partnership. If you know an organization or institution that would love to partner with us, please let them know. We are always looking for that. Um, and then I wanna talk about Field Inclusive Week. So again, the sponsorship from uh, the Nature Conservancy has allowed us to do this. So our Field Inclusive Week is going to be from January 15th through the 21st. And this is gonna be a virtual online event. So we decided to make it virtual for the first time around so that it can be inclusive and anyone can join from anywhere. Uh, so the link is down there if you wanna check it out. We have an incredible lineup of speakers and panelists. Uh, Murray and I are also hosting a workshop on science communication because everyone loves to, would like to know, you know how to get involved in science communication and everything like that. So we'll be hosting a workshop at the end of that week. Um, but again, some of our panels, we have a panel on field safety. We have a panel on disabilities and field work, field work recovery. And again, we have our science communication workshop. So I urge you to follow that link, visit us on our website, uh, fieldinclusive.org and check that out, sign up for some events. And um, we're really looking forward to putting that event on. So last but not least, I just wanna go through again, ways that you can support us. Again, whether it be individual, institution, or an organization. Donate, <laughs> become a corporate sponsor. If you're a bigger organization or institution and want to become a corporate sponsor, we have a corporate sponsor brochure up on our website that you can um, download and view. Uh, support our online shop. We have a shop online. We have a little shop online with uh, merchandise that uh, that um, has our official field inclusive logo. We have magnets, pencils, uh, keychains, stickers. Um, even that is is supporting field inclusive and what we're hoping to accomplish. 
follow and engage with us on social media. So we are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. So YouTube will be used to house the recordings from our Field Inclusive Week and any other videos that Field Inclusive produces. So um, our handle is uh, at Field Inclusive for all of those social media. So please, please, please follow us there. Interact and engage with us when we make a post, when we, um, um, you know, uh, when we give an update, when we talk about an upcoming event, share, like, comment, <laughs> use our hashtag Field Inclusive. I mean, that, that's a great way to, you know, engage with us. Uh, subscribe to our newsletter. So on our website, we have a, a monthly newsletter. Right now it's monthly that goes out and it just gives you updates of what Field Inclusive has been up to, um, new sponsors and collaborations that are happening, et cetera, events that are like this event. So thank you to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences for reaching out to us and coordinating this event. Um, it will talk about events like that that's featuring our Field Inclusive members. So. Uh, subscribe to our monthly newsletter. You will not be disappointed. <laughs> and as always, reach out to us about ways to collaborate. Any ideas at all that come to mind when you know you're just thinking about, well, is there other ways that I can help besides donating? Yes. <laughs> the short answer is yes. So please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and again, please visit our website and you will get more information about all of us. You'll get more information about our organization, what we stand for, our team, ways to support us, um, all of these, uh, these grant and award opportunities, et cetera. So with that, my presentation is going to conclude. So I have my contact information up here as well as my social media, if you would like to reach out. Uh, I also have Field Inclusive's contact as well as our social media, our email, and again, our website. Um, again, I, feel, I believe that the museum will share this along with the participants that registered, um, but if not, feel free to take a screenshot of this screen um, so that you will have it for the future. But with that, I thank you all for, for listening. I hope, you know, with Murray and my presentation, I hope you were inspired and I hope you got to see a little bit more about what Field Inclusive is about, why it's important, and um, where we hope to go in the future. And we hope that with your help, <laughs> we, can, we can get there. So um, thank you so much for listening. And with that, I will stop sharing screen. All right, thank you so much, Lauren, and okay. Murray, you as well. Uh, excellent presentation, and we've got some questions that I've written up already. Uh, uh, viewers, if you all have any questions, feel free to drop those in the chat and we'll get to those um, as we're going through. Um, so just one of the first things um, I thought of was, was what has been one of your biggest hurdles in starting um, this nonprofit? <laughs> and just, because uh, obviously it's a, it's a big, You've done a lot in six months. You've done a lot, and it's, that's phenomenal. So, like, what has been one of the biggest hurdles, and you know, like, how long was this kind of in the making before it premiered? Um, yeah, I think one of the biggest hurdles for me was just like being a PhD student and having classes mm -hmm. and like dissertation and research, and mm -hmm. I have a children's book manuscript due soon, and just like my hands in all these different things while still trying to like get all the paperwork correct, like make sure the IRS doesn't come for me. Like right. <laughs> just like finding the time to like get everything started properly and in place has been a little bit of a time hurdle for me. Okay. But I'm very glad that um, I have Lauren to help me out <laughs> and now a new intern, um, Kayla Soups, who is great. And just being able to like get it all together soon, it did come together really fast. <laughs> but it was good. We're glad for that. Yeah. yeah, great, Lauren. Did you have anything to add to that? Or? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm echoing everything that that Murray just said. Again, our our college has been a faculty and staff there that have sat down and helped us so far. They've been a huge, huge help. But again, they always remind us, you both are PhD students. You're here to finish your PhD, but we want to help you in any way, shape, or form that we can. So we're very, very grateful for them for that. So, but yeah, I mean, this idea, like we were literally, we started off as a two-person team, like, and I mean, and now we have Kayla. So she's our intern from CNR, but still like our team is small. And I mean, we, we appreciate you recognizing that we have done a lot in 
six months. Like once you said that, I thought about it and I was like, wow, we have done a lot in six months. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, but yeah. And so I, I really, yeah, like the hurdle of just that and just, you know, continuing to, um, really like coordinate and again, reach out to people that we think would, you know, make a good partner or a collaborator and just really thinking about those ideas and ways that they can collaborate meetings. I mean, we have meetings and meetings on top of meetings. And so, you know, just again, as Murray said, working with all that stuff with our nonprofit, and then we have our PhDs and we have meetings and meetings and meetings <laughs> with our PhDs. So it's like double the work, but I mean, it's been really, really beneficial. Um, we've heard from a ton of people who, again, once we explain to them why, you know, field inclusive is important and why our mission is important, then they start to understand and they're like, yes, this is very, very important. And what ways, you know, can we help? So, I mean, for that, we're really, really appreciative. So, I mean, we just keep moving forward. Um, we just take it day by day. And we just, we hope for the best. And so far it's worked for us. So yeah. I mean, hey, if it's working, don't question it. Yeah, if it's working. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, and then uh, here's a question from one of our registrants, Will, uh, who asks, how can filmmakers and content creators support field scientists' work? So you mentioned that you all have lots of social media going, and uh, mm -hmm. as someone who follows both of your, your personal accounts, I see lots of fun things, lots of TikToks and stuff, and I'm just like, great. Um, so, so how can filmmakers, you know, kind of help support and boost that? That's a really good question. I think the first thing that comes to mind is just like a share or a retweet, like really goes a long way. Like, mm -hmm. don't underestimate the power of sharing. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, I really think that. Um, Engaging with the SciComm aspect is really important, um, making science more accessible to the general public or people who might not fully understand um, what the work is or what science is, um, as well as the field safety aspect, just continuing to spread that message and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. make it accessible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree with that. And, and Will, thanks for your question. So Will has been a huge supporter. Like, not just for field inclusive but for both of us so like will we we really really we really really thank you <laughs> so but i i definitely i i really again i do um echo murray's murray's point about a share and a retweet that it goes a long way believe it or not um and just again with science communication so the thing about science communication and it's it's one thing that i mean it's it's a little bit hard of an ask when you're, especially when it comes to academia, because we already have 50 million other things going on. But I believe Murray and I both have been able to tailor, you know, our SciComm with what we're doing with our research and realizing how important it is to, you know, for the general public to understand what we do as scientists. Um, mm -hmm. It would break down so many barriers if, you know, if, if people just took some time to, to really, break down their science and again I know that's a hard ask because we as researchers you know we write all of our academic papers and we publish and it's like we do this research we publish it and that's it where it's like no I, I you know I and I think Murray would agree with me I want it to go further than just that and I really want people to understand <laughs> what what it is that I'm doing because again and I use this example all the time um and 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 Michael you, you have seen it with on my Instagram I tell people that I'm out in the woods chasing woodpeckers and they look at me sideways like what is she talking about like what <laughs> what but now now that I can go on there and make these videos of what I actually get to do in the field what my research entails what I'm doing and why it's important people are like oh okay now we understand now we get it and then not only that but just that engagement too I mean it makes it worthwhile you know and then it makes it it makes me see you know oh well someone it, even if it's just one person I'm like someone is benefiting from seeing what I'm doing and enjoying the ride and laughing at my struggles but you know it's, it's all in good fun <laughs> yeah and uh I see Will you have your hand raised uh we will allow participants to unmute and uh, contribute to the conversation after we end the recording so just hang on to that thought for just a second Will um, and so we have another question or trio of questions that you kind of started to answer, Lauren, uh, from Tamara, who asks, what is an ornithologist? 
how do they help the world, and how can we become ornithologists? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, let's start Character with the question. simplest one. What yeah! is an ornithologist? <laughs> what is an ornithologist? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So ornithologists. So ornithology is the study of birds. So as ornithologists, we work with birds. <laughs> that's, that's basically yes. it. Um, we work with birds. Um, we're out in nature enjoying birds. We're, you know, we're bird watching. Um, anyone can become an ornithologist, really. I mean, stepping out in your backyard, bird watching, you're an ornithologist. <laughs> like, you, you can consider yourself an ornithologist. Um, but professional wise, I mean, we, so like Murray and I, you can go to school and get advanced degrees. Um, so in wildlife biology, natural resources, have a, uh, research, um, a research project or a topic that focuses on birds, because what we're really doing is with our research, we're getting, <laughs> we're getting down and dirty, literally, um, in, in that science of really looking at our, you know, specific questions. So with Murray, it's light pollution, with mine, it's climate change. So, you know, and we're using birds as a model. Um, why birds are important, they're a keystone species. So um, birds in general, so keystone species means that like they can, like a species that can really like tell us that something is, is wrong with the environment or like really like if there's any change or shift in the environment, this species is affected. And when that species is affected, we know that, hey, we got to do something because if that species is infected, other species are going to be infected, you know, affected as well. So um, birds being a keystone species, I mean, uh, there's, you know, tons and tons and tons of birds in, in the world. So they make for a great, you know, research model. They make for a great, you know, species to study. Um, and I think Murray will agree with me also. I mean, I've, I've been having so much fun in my program getting to work with birds, getting to study birds, getting to talk about what I do. As you can see, I mean, anytime that I give a presentation, I get giggly and bubbly and it will, ne it will never fail that one or two people will come up to me and they're like, oh my gosh. I love your energy, your enthusiasm. I can tell that you love what you do. And I mean, that's it. Like, that's it right there. Like, I can't tell you how many people just still don't understand what I do, but they're like, not many of us can, you know, say that, you know, we're, we're, you know, doing what we love and, you know, you're actually out there doing what you love and you're enjoying doing it. And I mean, that's, that's it. So, so do what you love, love what you do. <laughs> yeah. <That's it>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that is, that's a good motto to live yeah. by. Yeah. Um, and, and so you were talking about your studies on climate change and Murray, mm -hmm. your study on light pollution. Mm -hmm. uh, both of those are things that obviously impact humans. Well, I should say climate change obviously impacts humans, mm -hmm. but a lot of people don't recognize light as a form of pollution. Right. Um, right. And so could you talk a little bit about like how light can be polluting? Yeah. yeah, so light is considered a sensory pollutant, and mm -hmm. that just means that it's any, anything that blocks like your natural rhythms, your like biological mm -hmm. clock, and the signals that you receive from the environment. And one of the biggest things that I'm focusing on is actually sleep. And so if you think about, you know, you're scrolling on your phone at night or you have like bright lights <laughs> <laughs> like outside that's coming in, it gets really hard to like get a good restful night's sleep. Mm -hmm. And the same is true for humans as well as birds. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm trying to dive like really deep into with the birds is how does that affect them on like a metabolic level, a cellular level and um, how that might affect their growth into adults. And like Lauren has said before, um, birds are also indicators for how humans might behave despite like how different of a species they are. Um, so if we're finding like, well, what I'm finding actually is like <laughs> birds in light pollution, the chicks that grow up in light pollution are taking a little bit longer to leave the nest, I believe. And also mm -hmm. they have like a higher um, metabolic, um, a higher blood sugar levels. Interesting. And so even in birds, a high blood sugar level could be indicative of like a metabolic disease such as diabetes. And so mm -hmm. if that's happening so quickly to the birds, then what's happening to us? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, this very uh, interesting, you know, we always think about scientists in labs with mice. Yeah, and absolutely. You're quite the opposite of outside of the lab and with birds of yeah, all things. Just taking the lab outside. And so, that's yeah, it. yeah, that's 
it's amazing, and you know, I hope the the research you're able to find some strong correlations and findings. Uh, so, yes. passing all the good vibes for the for the dissertations. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I'm trying to wrap it up in one more semester. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, and so in the chat, we have another question from Will. So how do social safety principles apply to underrepresented groups in a lab science setting? So kind of on that, that same uh, note of <laughs> you like, all, yeah. yeah. So in the, I think in the field and in the lab, it kind of um, comes together very similarly. Um, um, speaking from like a university lab experience, because like that's the main experience that I have. Um, sometimes underrepresented individuals might not feel um, like the space is welcoming or like they're getting the level of support that they need. Um, a lot of it can be the individual like not wanting to speak out, like not wanting to like cause issues or like rock the boat. But right. um, speaking out, one is important, but also it shouldn't be the individual's job to do that. We don't want to have it as like a bottom up kind of thing. We want it to have an institutional level policy that applies to everyone. Right. Um, that was one of the main reasons also for starting Field Inclusive because um, when I got the car magnets for my field work, um, Field Inclusive didn't exist yet. And I didn't want like my department to like stop caring or like stop making magnets or field safety gear once I graduated. Mm -hmm. I wanted that to be in place like long after me for everybody who came after me. And so field inclusive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. And to I mean to piggyback off of that, like the car magnets, they became really popular once she posted a picture on her social media. People were commenting, yeah. like, where can I get one of these? And so it was like <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. an idea <laughs> light bulb you know so yeah. i mean you know making that again like that and that's where the um where the idea of the crowdfunding project that i uh referenced is 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 coming you know is coming from so we're we're asking for our money from you know individual donors so that we can produce more of those items and have them available you know housed in our college so anyone can you know if they feel like they need a magnet if they feel like they need a vest you know they can there's a place where they can go, you know, to to get them. And again, they have our College of Natural Resources logo on it. Um, with that, I mean, we're hoping to also like provide those, you know, templates, like just an easy, like somewhere maybe even housed on the field inclusive page. Like if there is another organization or institution that's like, huh, well, I'm interested in developing car magnets and they want to put their logo on it. There's a place that they can go. They can find the templates. They can find like an easy rundown how to list and you know, develop their own. So, I mean, we don't want that idea to just stop uh, you know, in our college. We want it to hopefully you know, go across our university in different programs. So there's many other programs that do field work. Um, you know, we have marine, earth, atmospheric sciences that do field work, uh, the entomology department. I mean, so we want it to span not only throughout our, our college, but also hopefully other, uh, other organizations and institutions that would, you know, want some car magnets or would you know want to develop some car magnets or some I other identifying items that they have a place that's you know easy accessible and they know where to go that they can you know work towards I you know work towards producing those things so but yeah mm -hmm. yeah so uh Murray at least for you would you say that the car magnets was kind of that catalyst moment for starting field inclusive like I believe so the magnets plus the 2020 kind of isolation across the board mm -hmm. and just hearing s similar stories from like every minority person that I know in the <laughs> field is like okay we all have these stories and it's an issue across the board and somebody should do something about it yeah yeah Lauren was there like a different catalyst for you or was it pretty much you know kind of the same thing of you know really <laughs> for me I mean so I, I have an advantage because the property that I work on, again, it's a, it's a, it's a public property. So compared to a private property, I could totally see, you know, there being some very different issues, but I will say that, um, I mean, this property spans like thousands and thousands of acres. So, I mean, the, and the individuals that I work with, although we, some of us may be working on that same property, we're like far away from each other. Um, so, you know, it comes into play when, again, 
it's a public it's a public space anyone can be out there so you know sometimes i mean if i see a person that's you know walking or i see some someone that looks like they're being suspicious i mean the you know i i have this you know alert that i'm like all right let's stay alert here like you know because i don't know what this person is doing so it's it's very it's it's very different for me being out there and then plus two i mean i i brought up this point um on a field safety panel i was on um just a separate point but really one thing that um you know people can do especially when they have you know not just minorities but i mean really anyone in the field check in on your workers um, and, you know, I mean, it, a, a simple text goes a long way, like, you know, how are you doing? What are you going to get done? I mean, there are some days where, you know, I have to leave the field, but then go back out in the evening times. And my, so I, I call her my boss, the lady that I work for, the, the organization that I work for during the summer, like she's like the head over all of us. And she makes sure that, you know, she knows where each of us are and, you know, if you're going back out in the field at, you know, this time, text me when you're out there, text me when you leave. I mean, it just, it's as simple as that. Um, and I had someone ask me, they were like, you know, well, I, I, I forgot how they, they asked me, but it was really, they were basically asking me, you know, like, it, is that just like a field safety protocol, like for minorities or like, it was, it was some kind of question like that. And I was like, well, I mean, it, it can be perceived in a different way. If you're not a minority, they can just take it as, oh, well, she's just checking up on me, letting me know, you know, or, or you know, just letting, just asking, you know, how I am or what I'm doing or whatever. But for minorities, it can go even further. It can be us really saying, you know, oh my gosh, like, thanks for checking on me. You took the time out of your day to check on me. You care about me and my well being. So, I mean, it can perceive in different ways, you know, depending on, um, you know, the, the group that you're from. But again, I, it's beneficial. Uh, either way I think so but yeah yeah kind of kind of like a, a work mom or field yeah, <laughs> you know, research like, mom like, or li yeah. like literally she's my work mom yes. like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and then speaking of mothers uh we have a, a question from Charlotte <laughs> hi mom <laughs> and so Charlotte asks have you engaged with local police with the mission and needs uh for your organization for both their awareness and their input? So we have not, and that is a fabulous idea because one of the things that we do advocate for is like a student and advisor, like in their field site, getting to know the property owners or getting to know right. the like local law enforcement, just so they're aware that they're out there and what they're doing. But yeah, that would be a really good idea to like bring like maybe some police on board to like just kind of help spread the message and like give their input. like which she said, um, yeah. and to help better our mission. So yeah, yeah. thanks for the idea. <laughs> excellent idea, love it. Well, and but that, that was, that's an excellent idea because it reminds me, so funny story, um, the, uh, uh, someone from the, um, uh, the, the Longleaf Alliance, I believe, I was talking with them and they were saying, we were talking about police and everything and they were saying that um, someone had came up with this idea where like if someone got a speeding ticket and the police pulled them over instead of them paying a speeding ticket, they should donate to this organization. So I was like, huh, like make a donation to an organization to get out of your speeding ticket. Like interesting. Hmm. Like interesting. So we're talking about, you know, partnering with law enforcement. I'm like, hmm, donate to field and get out of your speeding ticket. I was like, that is a brilliant idea. It's, it's a way to to contribute to the community you know yes, and really help yes, out yes um, yes for sure yeah and so <laughs> there's switching gears uh i believe it's annie skinner I, I can't really read the the name sorry yeah ann uh ann asks what have you found with the red cockaded woodpeckers and climate change lauren if you're able to share any of those findings <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for your question so um i will say that the um idea stemmed from some researchers who did some work out um on eglin air force base so there is a rcw there are rcw populations out on Eglin Air Force Base. Um, where Eglin is, it's on the Western Panhandle of Florida. So you can imagine that on the Western Panhandle of Florida, they are experiencing many, many, many extreme weather events, um, as well as increasing temperatures. So um, with that, they experienced a ton of hurricanes. 
And what these hurricanes will do is they will knock down RCW cavity trees. So the cavity, so the trees that they use to make their cavities, their homes, their nests. And so with that, um, researchers started looking at these, these weather and temperature impacts. And they found that it severely altered um, the population for adult RCWs. So they also found that um, there was a severe decline in nestling success or what we call brood reduction. So with that finding, where is where my research question comes into play is we're wondering if that you know future and that decline of those eglin populations if it's the future of my populations up here in the north carolina sand hills as well as like surrounding areas like fort bragg weymouth woods etc so um i am in my second year i have developed some research questions that i want to look at uh related to climate change so looking at different things like um food Food provisions from the parents, so how often the parents are visiting the nest, but as well as nestling diets. So looking specifically at what the um, nestlings that the, the chicks are eating, what the parents are giving to the nestlings, because um, we're talking about climate change here. So one thing, one cool thing about <laughs> wildlife biologists is you're not really just focusing on your focal species, you also have to understand everything else that impacts them. So not only do I have to focus on these birds, I have to think about the insects, think about their prey resources, and how climate change is impacting their prey resources. So I mean, it's like a, it's like a never ending, a never ending story, right? Um, so but looking at different things like that, um, resource availability, uh, continuing to look at um, temperature and weather when I'm out in the field recording those things, using a historic weather data set. So the great thing about my research is that I have 40 plus years of high quality data of high quality data from this species because it being federally endangered a lot of time money effort <laughs> has been put into managing these species and so we have this long term data set that I can work with and looking at the question of climate change and having this long term data set uh, it it really really helps in the long run to have long term data like that because it allows you to um, when you're trying to answer this question, especially if it's something like climate change, looking at different trends and stuff, well, if you sit here and you're like, oh, well, I have 40 plus years of data and these are the trends that I'm seeing, that's easier to, you know, come across to people. Whereas if you only had like maybe like 10 or 20 years of data, it's just sort of like, hmm, is that really what we're seeing? So, <laughs> but so to answer your question, um, those are the things that I'll be looking for here in the coming uh, years within my program. And I'm really looking forward to what I will I will find. So I'm excited to see what I find. I'm excited to share it with everyone and anyone. So be be looking out for that. But thank you for your question. Yeah. All right. And I'm, I'm going to end the recording on one last question. But uh, if you all are willing to hang out for just a little bit longer, we can um, have the direct Q&A so people can directly unmute. So uh, last question is, how do you stay inspired or encouraged? Because I know uh, anything in JEDI or DEI work can be very draining and exhausting, especially when you are part of that ma marginalized community. Um, so what is one way or, or some ways that you take care of yourself, your mental health, and you know each other, really? Yeah. So one way for me is just like completely switching gears and doing something totally different like i like to read for fun i love playing video games so like just taking that time to like shut off the brain and mm -hmm. just relax a little bit mm -hmm. but another thing is also the community itself it's like it encourages me to keep going to know that there are so many people who can like benefit from the work from field inclusive and who are excited about what we're doing and support us and so i want to continue to work with that and try to make some kind of a difference within the field yeah mm -hmm. yeah and lauren i would say for me yeah how do i <laughs> <laughs> self-care <laughs> Self-care. Um, so for me, I like to read as well. Um, I also like to just step outdoors and just take a walk, drop everything, <laughs> drop all my emails, and just take a walk. Um, if I'm very, very ambitious, so where my field site is, it's about an hour and a half away from Raleigh. So give or take, depending on my schedule, I'll go down 
to the North Carolina Sand Hills and just sit out there with my woodpeckers. Like, I mean, it just, it, it's, it's just a way, you know, to, like you said, just step away from everything because it can get tiring. It can get exhausting. And especially when, you know, when, you know, people are looking to minority communities to answer these questions. Like, you know, like they're just, they're depending on us to, you know, answer these questions and, you know, and, and, and make changes and such. And we're just like, it's gonna, it's gonna take an effort to come from everybody and especially the people who have not had to experience what minorities have been through. So again, going back to the example that I used with that gentleman from the institution that I spoke with, he, you know, he realized soon after, you know, of his privilege, he recognized his privilege and he was like, yeah, he recognized his privilege and he was like, okay, well now I see, you know, and I'm, I, I want to continue to see how, you know, this is, is important and beneficial, especially when it comes to minorities, because don't get me wrong. He is all for, you know, putting minorities in the field, having that, letting them gain field experience. But again, he was focused on that physical field safety aspect of, you know, uh, because I mean, he, he went into his training and everything. He was like, well, we train them how to identify, you know, poisonous plants, these animals, how to look out for stump holes. <laughs> and so he came in thinking that that's what field inclusive was about. And I was like, no, sir. No. <laughs> I, was like, step back. I was like, no, sir. <laughs> so, but it was a learning experience. So again, I don't yeah. say this to poke fun of him. He, he actually gave us a learning experience to where it was like, we need to take a step back and really yeah. start from the beginning, baby steps define things. Um, I mean, even Murray had a conversation with some folks, they didn't know what a HBCU meant, you know? And so we were like, little things like that. We, to us, it's like a no brainer, but it's, it's, it right. made us realize that taking these little steps is going to be beneficial to allow people to understand, you know, where we're coming from as an organization, what we stand for, why this is important, what it's about. So, yeah. All right, well, we are at time for our recording. Um, so thank you all who joined us today for this live presentation. Uh, if, uh, thank you, Murray and Lauren, for being able to, to work with us with this. And hopefully, um, you know, this kind of kicks off and, and uh, garners some more attention for Field Inclusive Week next week. And I'm excited. I know I'll be there. Um, and so, now we'll be ending the recording, but those of you who are watching live, if you want to hang out and talk to us directly, um, we'll be here for about another 15 minutes or so. Um, otherwise, uh, feel free to join us at the end of this month. So rather than the first Friday, the end of this month, um, we're going to be doing a, a professional preview that, to kick off astronomy days here at the museum. So um, stay tuned and look out for your emails for that. Thanks, everyone.